Hi, welcome. This is a Concepts and Connections for Unit 1. And this is going to cover um, chapters 1 through 3, well, and 4.1. And we're going to try to make connections between the major concepts, so linking ideas we learn in the individual chapters together to show that you need to build on um, what you've learned in each chapter in order to maximize your understanding of the additional chapters. All right, so let's take a look at our first concept. Okay, this first concept is elements. Okay, elements is a simple concept. And the definition then of elements, these are pure substances um, that we find on the periodic table. So here we see the initial concept at the top. Okay, and now we're going to look at some of the connections. So the main connections that we learned about related to elements are that elements are atoms, okay, that elements are pure substances. But what's important is elements. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur make up 98% of living things. And these living things are made out of macromolecules. All right, so let's take a look at these. Okay, so elements are atoms. Right? So here's a picture of an atom. We've seen atoms. Inside is the nucleus. The nucleus has the protons, which are positively charged. And it has the electrons, or the neutrons, which are neutral. Okay, so inside here there's a positive charged proton, neutrons are negative charged, around it are the electrons, these are negatively charged. The atomic number, right here the atomic number, this is the number of protons in the nucleus. So if we count protons positive, one, there's one, there's the second one, one, two, so the atomic number is two. Okay, and this is, corresponds to helium. Next, we have the atomic mass. The atomic mass is the total number of protons plus neutrons. So we have two protons, one, two neutrons. It gives us a mass of four. But remember, we have to um, sum all the isotopes that exist, so we don't get an exact value of four. Next, the concept elements, the connection. Elements are pure substances on the periodic table. So here's a periodic table. Each of these substances we see here, or we, each of these entries in the periodic table, correspond to specific elements, right? So here's hydrogen. That is an element, hydrogen, okay? And then here we see carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. These are important elements. Phosphorus, sulfur, okay? These are some important elements uh, in terms of biology. But each one of these entries are a uh, individual element. You can see listed at the top, we have the atomic number for carbon is 6, and its mass is 12, and so forth. Okay, our next connection is that elements, certain elements make up all our macromolecules. Okay. So, what do we have here? We have this first structure is a protein. If we look at it, what elements do we see in it? We see carbon, right? Lots of carbons, it makes up the backbone, carbon, carbon, carbon. We have nitrogens in blue. There's a nitrogen, okay? Here's a nitrogen, here's a nitrogen. And uh, we have hydrogen, okay? If we look at this amino acid here, this is cysteine, okay? What is unique about cysteine? It has sulfur. And sulfur is really important for a system because it forms this called a, um, a disulfide bridge. Disulfide bridge. Okay, so here we see those major elements making up macromolecules. Here's a, a sugar, glucose, right? A monosaccharide, carbon, oxygen, there's an oxygen, okay? And carbon, and there's also hydrogens, and these make up these important macromolecules. Another macromolecule, a lipid. This is a phospholipid, okay? If we zoom in closely on the phospholipid, we can see all these molecules. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but there's a nitrogen, there's carbon backbone, here's a phosphorus, here's an oxygen, okay? More carbons, more oxygens. Over here, DNA, again, here's a phosphorus that's important. We have carbons, oxygens, and the bases inside, remember, the nitrogenous bases we learned about in chapter four? They have nitrogen. Okay, so these are very important elements. This is the important connection. These are important elements. They're important because they make up macromolecules. Macromolecules make up all living organisms.
Okay, let's look at another concept then. The next concept is that chemical bonds and interactions are important. Okay, this is a concept. And here's a list of reasons why they're so important. Okay, let's walk our way through this list of important connections. So, chemical bonds and interactions, important concept, connection. Different bonds and interactions have different strengths. So here's a list of chemical bonds and interactions we learned about from strongest to weakest. Covalent bonds, sharing electrons, strong ionic bonds. Uh, this is between two ions, a positive ion, a cation, and a negative ion, an anion, not as strong. Okay. This was like the salt we saw and it dissolved in water. Hydrogen bonds are weak, uh, requires the, um, we saw an example with water, hydrogen bonding, because oxygen is electronegative, has a negative charge, partial negative charge, and it can bond with a uh, neighboring hydrogen that has a partial positive charge. And then hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals were weak interactions. Okay, here's an example of water being electronegative, or being polar, and having electronegativity. So here's the oxygen. You see it's covalently bound to these hydrogens, but it's not sharing electrons evenly. So they're pulled near the oxygen. Okay, They're kind of being pulled more into the center. And that gives the oxygen more of a negative charge because the electrons are negative. Overall, this makes water polar because it has a negative region and it has positive regions. Okay. So now if you get multiple waters together, they orientate themselves so the negative region of one is near the positive of a neighbor. This gives water all its unique properties that we talked about. So water's polar, so it's related to why ice floats and it doesn't sink, which is important to maintain liquid water in lakes and the ocean. Evaporative cooling, um, this is the cooling property of water on our skin or sweat on our skin, cohesion and surface tension. Okay, so here we see liquid, uh, liquid water at the bottom is very dense. All these water molecules are near each other. As it um, cools down, the individual water molecules kind of set up in a distinct matrix. And they become uh, orientated a certain amount of distance apart from each other based on hydrogen bonding between the atoms. And then the gaseous phase where water is least dense. concept. Chemical bonds and interactions are important. And then the connection is specific bonds make each macromolecule. So here we have an amino acid linked together to make a protein. Okay, And this bond here linking one amino acid to its neighbor is called a peptide linkage. Okay, So here's an amino acid, one, here's a second one, here's a third one. They're tied together through um, a peptide bond. Okay. Here is a carbohydrate, maltose. This is a disaccharide, two of them together, held together by a glycosidic linkage. It's a type of covalent bond. It's a strong bond. That solid line indicates a covalent bond. Sharing of electrons. Here's a lipid, right? This is a triglyceride. Okay, triglycerides held together by each of these fatty acids. It's held to the top part here by a ester linkage. A strong covalent bond, okay, ester linkage for triglycerides. And then for DNA and RNA, each of these building blocks here, this is called a nucleotide. Here's one, here's the next one above it. It's linked together through a phosphate linkage. Phosphate linkage, okay. So it's a bond through this phosphate, this phosphodiester linkage. So that bond is called a phosphodiester bond. Okay. All these bonds that hold these macromolecules together are covalent, so they're very strong. All right, we learned about functional groups. And this was a kind of, we looked at a table and there's lots of different functional groups. And, and when you learn them at first, you kind of wonder, what's the point of learning all these different functional groups? Well, let's look at some examples. Okay, functional groups are important, first off, because they give molecules very unique properties. So here's two sugars, okay, two varieties. Here's glucose, here's a variety of galactose. And they each have a functional group added to them. In this case, they have an amino group right here, amino group added. So here's a glucose plus this amino group gives us glucosamine. Here's a galactose plus an amine gives us galactosamine. So it gives us varieties of these different types of sugars. And maybe you've heard of glucosamine and gla galactosamine. These have become um, popular in terms of supplements for joint health. So glucosamine and galactosamine and uh, connective tissue in your joints. All right, here's an amino acid. So how do we get an amino acid? We have an amino group on one side, 
On the other side, we have a carboxylic acid group. You put those together, acid, amino, amino acid. So this makes a unique amino acid. You need these two functional groups to make amino acids. Amino acids make proteins. Okay, let's look at DNA. So we can't have DNA without important functional groups. All right, here we have phosphates. Okay, here's a phosphate group. There's a phosphate, here's a phosphate. Okay, they are all along this backbone of DNA. In fact, the backbone of DNA, remember, is called a sugar phosphate backbone because it's repeated. Phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. So phosphates are important. Here's another functional group with DNA, hydroxyl, OH. So on one side, what we call the 5' prime end, we have a phosphate group. The 3' prime end is recognized by having an OH or the hydroxyl group. So to understand these macromolecules and the properties of them, we have to recognize these specific functional groups. Okay. Functional groups are also important when we look at the lipids. Okay. They're going to give, especially phospholipids are a great example, we see some important groups. So we have a phosphate here. Okay. If you look at a phosphate, you notice it has a negative charge. Okay. That's the head group, what we call the hydrophilic head. Hydrophilic means what? Water loving. And because phosphate has a negative charge, okay, this part above it has a positive charge, it can interact with water, which has partial charges. So like things dissolve like things. So something with a charge likes to interact with water. The rest of this molecule is hydrophobic. This is the hydrophobic region with these fatty acids. Okay? And so this property of phospholipids, it has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, makes it amphipathic, which means it has a water-loving portion and a water-fearing portion. And that allows us to make phospholipid bilayers, or plasma membranes. They naturally orientate themselves in this manner with their hydrophilic head group on the outside because it has charges and water's on the outside which has charges and so they interact with each other. Same with the inside of this cell, there's cytoplasm. So here's all the um, hydrophobic portions of the phospholipid are orientated inside so this middle portion of the membrane, the internal portion, is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water. And this is important. We'll learn about membranes in the next unit. Okay, so that's a basic overview of trying to link the four chapters we learned about by emphasizing specific concepts with their corresponding connection.